Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the video today. As we go into part two of the message, The Beauty of Holiness. The Beauty of Holiness. Last time we got through four points. There's a lot of points in this message. It is certainly not an introduction, three points and a conclusion by any means. But we're going to read again 1 Chronicles 16.29. 1 Chronicles 16.29 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The fifth point in the beauty of holiness, looking at the reality of what holiness actually does for us when we live in holiness instead of trying to mimic holiness or when we recognize it is God's righteousness that changes us from the inside out instead of our self-righteousness that tries to change us from the outside in. And so that's what we're looking at. I hope that if you didn't watch it, that you will go back and watch part one, and that will kind of get you the flow of where we are. Number five, it sets us free from former things. Behold, all things have become new. The old is supposed to pass away. The attitudes from before is supposed to change in us. And we are supposed to begin to show Christ's likeness in what we do. Proverbs 10.20 says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. Boy. See, Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit and you... I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing there. And you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. How do I deal with the motive that is in me? And again, we've been talking about this over and over again. It's not trying to deal with the actions. It's dealing with the motive. What motivates us to sin? When we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So folks, does it take a theologian to understand that? L let me say to you that if you are fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you aren't walking in the Spirit. Don't try to say, I'm a spirit-filled, gift-filled, fruit-filled, spirit-filled Christian while you're living in the lust of the flesh. Verse 25 of Galatians chapter 5 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit so if we live in the spirit we are to walk in the spirit you know what the major problem is in christianity we call off these statements we read these verses we we, we tell people this is how you should live and we don't even understand what it means we don't even understand what it means to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. And ultimately what this means is that we allow the Spirit to do exactly what God sent Him to do, what the, what the Father sent Him to do. The Spirit was sent to rebuke us to exhort us, to deal with us, to teach us. What is the ultimate goal that the Spirit is doing? I I'm sorry, my friends. The ultimate goal of what the Spirit is doing is not to give you gifts. The ultimate goal of what the Spirit is doing is not to give you power. Does he do that? 
Absolutely. No question about it. But we center our focus and attention on those things. The ultimate goal of what the Spirit is doing is to prepare a bride that is spotless. A bride that is prepared to be the bride of Christ as we celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the first days of our appearance into the kingdom, we, we receive this wonderful gift of the marriage supper of the Lamb. The ultimate goal of what the Spirit is doing is to change us and make us Christ-like so that we are without blemish. And thus the message of holiness. Holiness sets us free from the former things. So if we say I'm a Christian and yet nothing changes, that is not holiness. If I'm still living in the past, I'm not in the center of God's will. If I'm still living the way that I did some 40 years ago when I first accepted him, I'm not living in the center of God's will. I'm not walking in the spirit. I'm not living in the spirit because when I live and walk in the spirit, the spirit changes me. It isn't something that might happen. It isn't something that could happen. It is something that will happen. So Mike, are you teaching that the outside doesn't change? No, if that is what you are hearing, you are totally misunderstanding the message. What I'm saying to you is, is that before God ever concerns himself with your outside, he will change your inside. Because changing your outside doesn't set you free from former things. But changing your inside will always set you free from former things. As I have quoted before, a guy that I had great, great respect for made this statement, I sin all I want to. I sin all I want to. I just don't want to. It takes away the want to. It takes away the motivation that causes us. It takes away our doubt that causes us to lack faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the essence of things unseen. But I trust in God. And, and, and that's where I get that from is because God, the Holy Spirit, is changing and mo motivating me. When we justify the wrong that we do, then we are not walking in the Spirit. Mike, do you ever do anything wrong? Oh, you don't have enough time to watch this video for me to list. But let me tell you what always, always happens when I fall short. Always. I never fall short and celebrate it. There's never a time that I don't fit up to what God wants me to do. And I know that I have not fit up to what God wants me to do. That I don't just become heartbroken in my spirit because I have let him down. Are you following me? I'm not trying to. I, I am totally against. And if you listen to part one, I told you that. And other messages. I'm totally against this self-righteous attitude. I'm not talking about self-righteousness. I'm talking about the recognition of when I fall short and don't fit up to what God wants. It becomes the desire of your heart. God no longer has to demand that of you. When the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you and you are living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, you desire to be like Christ. And when you fall short, you grieve for that falling short and come to Him in repentance. Number six, the beauty of holiness elevates all of society, all 
of society. Proverbs 14.34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 11.11, By the blessing of the upright the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. I'm probably going to make some of you angry at me. That's okay. It won't be the first time. America is never going to be righteous when our houses of government, the White House, the Supreme Court, and the Congress is filled with sin and unrighteousness. America is never going to be great as long as America fills its houses of government with unrighteous people. Righteousness and holiness elevates a society. As, and, and this was not in my original writing, of course. I, I have been asked this, as I'm recording this, I'm recording this on a Friday, and yesterday, Thursday, was the National Day of Prayer. I did take part. I took part in the Global Christian Relief Fund that put on a streaming prayer session and I logged on to that and took part in the prayer time with that. I've been asked numerous times through the years and I once did in the early part of my ministry. In fact, in the early part of my ministry, I was asked to do some of the prayers in the National Day of Prayer up at the courthouse or at the gazebo or at the whatever the church chose to have. And I'm talking the church corporately, not my church. But I have been asked, Mike, why don't you take part in the National Day of Prayer anymore? Why, why don't you celebrate it and put it out? And, and as I say, I did. I believe very, very firmly every newsletter that we put out begins with the statement, pray, pray, pray with Bible verses and then pray, pray, pray. If there's anything that I can encourage you to do in your life right now, it is pray and pray fervently and pray often. <laughs> Maybe I just wrote a new message there. I got very frustrated with the National Day of Prayer when I used to take part in it. See, at that time, my church was one of the fastest growing churches, and so we had lots of people in our church. And you came to discover that the organizers no longer really cared about the righteousness of the people that they put up to pray. They chose the people that they put up to pray by the size of their church because the attitude was if they chose pastors that had large churches, that would make the churches be involved in the National Day of Prayer and make the crowd be bigger. It's an attitude that goes on so it no longer mattered. And we had pastors like that in the town that I was in. We had pastors that openly stated from behind their pulpit, the Bible is not the inerrant word of God. Jesus Christ was not the perfect son of God. In fact, I'm not sure that I even believe in God. They stated that from behind their pulpit to their people and they were selected to pray in the National Day of Prayer because they had a big audience that would come to the National Day of Prayer to support their godless pastor standing up and saying a little cute prayer. In fact, the prayers no longer came from the heart anymore. They were written out in advance by big mega ministries that wrote out and told you this is what you need to pray. 
to try to make the prayers eloquent and more impressive instead of having people of God crying out to God and humbling themselves in repentance. That's what I said before the last election. We had this phony big national prayer meeting marching in Washington, D.C. Not one single preacher prayed for repentance for the sins of this nation. And as long as this nation is filled with sin, God is not going to pour out revival upon us. We must humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. We must... We must call a sacred assembly that goes from the smallest child to the greatest priest that begins to pray between the altar and the door. Oh my God, please pour out your spirit upon our church. We don't need revival in Washington, D.C. We need revival in our church. But we don't have that. That's why the society is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I get so passionate. Right now, my heart is just breaking in that issue. I'm not yelling and getting excited because I'm angry. I'm yelling and getting excited because it, it, it's like, what has happened to the churches? We're so busy worrying about elections. The church is supposed to elevate the society around it. If we are living in righteousness, that's what those verses in Proverbs 14.34 and Proverbs 11.11 11 says. We elevate the society. The problem we have is that we've allowed society and the media and politician and judges and the education system to dictate to us what righteousness even means. We have heroes who are living in absolute open sin and yet we work like crazy to say, oh, I think that they're Christians. Our ministers are heroes, not because they are godly, not because they are on their faces seeking God, not because they are preaching the truth, not because they have any concern about being a minister, but because they're larger than life. If I can become larger than life, then I become a hero in ministry. Why are we not seeing the, the nation, the society elevated? Joel 2, 15 to 18 tells us to blow the trumpet in Zion. Let me tell you something. You, you want to know what happens if you start blowing that trumpet? You think blowing that trumpet is going to make you popular? I, I, if I can say this to you folks, I've experienced popularity in ministry. I've, I've had the popularity. I had people all over the place seeking me to come and, and preach revivals in their churches and, and they followed our writing and, and they, we didn't have videos back then, but we had CDs and cassette tapes and they did that. They bought our t-shirts. They did all of the different things. All of the, I, I had the popularity. Want to see that popularity go away really, really fast? Start blowing the trumpet in Zion. I want you to notice in that before I read on. God didn't say to his watchmen on the watchtower, he didn't say to his prophets, blow the trumpet into the heathen and the lost. Blow the trumpet into Washington, D.C., preacher in America. You, you know what Zion represented? Zion was the representation of where God was. Blow the trumpet to the church. 
Blow the trumpet to the church that is exalting evolution and abortion and homosexuality and every kind of abomination that they can come up to exalt. Blow the trumpet in the church. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. When is the Lord going to be jealous and pity his people? When is the Lord going to pour out his spirit that is promised in Joel chapter 2 that we are reading from? When is that going to happen? When his people come together. And do you hear the cry of the priests and ministers? It's not some little fancy, eloquent, written out prayer. Oh God, our Father, thou shalt move in the middle of your people. And you, it is a cry. They are weeping. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give them not thine heritage to re give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Do you understand church in America? Do you understand Christian in America? The heathen are ruling over you. You have phony preachers. I'm sorry, I normally don't call this out on videos, but you have phony preachers like Kenneth Copeland getting on and saying, I don't care how poor you are, I am a billionaire, and you need to give your money not to my ministry, to me. Second Peter talks about they will make merchandise of you. The scripture lays it out exactly what's going to happen. And that's where we are. These mercenary preachers and mercenary prophets that are robbing God's people. And making us feel ashamed. One of my, and, and we appreciate those of you, let me tell you. Those of you, wow. Those of you that support this ministry, we appreciate you so much. You're the reason that we are able to keep doing what we keep doing every day. I'm, I'm not going to share a lot because I don't want to offend my very, very dear friend. A couple that I have just literally loved in ministry for a long, long time. And we've enjoyed a lot of really fun times together going out to eat and, and just talking and sharing with each other. They had planned to support the ministry and send checks to us on a regular basis and things went down in their lives and and it seems like that that happens a lot in our ministry you know a lot of these ministers promise you well if you'll send us fifty dollars every month God will give you a diamond ring on every finger and a new car in your parking lot dad always told me not to say this sorry dad hogwash my dear friend sent to me and said, well, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that we have had these crises and not been able to support you. Don't you ever, ever, ever be ashamed. 
These guys that tell you that you, it, it, God will bless you if you send them money. Quit listening to them. That's not what it's about. You're not going to bring revival to America by sending $50 to some phony that tells you, I don't care how poor you are, you need to support my billion dollar ministry. It's a phoniness. We're not elevating society because we're not being this people that gets between the altar and the door and begins to cry out, spare thy people, O Lord. Please don't give up on us. If you don't realize that America is absolutely ruled right now by heathen, and it isn't because God has rejected us. It's because we have rejected God. God isn't saying in these verses, just sit back and wait to see what happens. Just keep doing what you've been doing and it'll be okay. The definition of insanity is to keep doing what you've been doing and expect different results. And that is the picture of churchdom in American society. What you doing? We doing the same thing we've been doing. Has it brought anything, any fruit to the kingdom? Absolutely none. Then why do you continue doing it? Because we just keep doing what we've been doing and we're expecting for God to move on that. <laughs> Oh, my word. We don't need to have prayer meetings. We'll just pray at home. We are so debased in the American church by the lack of godly, righteous people. Even in the ministry, we are debased in the ministry by the lack of godly, righteous people. Are we as a church a remolder? Or a reflector. That goes along with something that I've said in other messages before. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? A thermostat or a remolder. Let me take it the other way and then I'm going to close. The thermometer and the reflector simply just reflects what society does. That's what we're doing, folks. That's why we are not elevating society. We're, we're reflecting society. Society says this is righteous. And the church, so let me go back to what I said at the end of last message when I said the devil makes a motion and our spirit, our attitude, our carnal mind seconds it. So society is saying, Righteousness, I see, that's what's being taught in one of the major denominations that is literally coming unraveled in one of the major denominations. The Bible was wrong. We know better now than what we did when the Bible was written. So therefore, we need to accept homosexuality in our churches and ordain homosexual bishops. That is when the church begins to reflect or be a thermostat. It is simply just, or I'm sorry, a thermometer. It, it, is, it is simply just showing what is going on in society. When you are a remolder or a thermostat, you are changing the attitudes around you. I say it laughingly. As I close, I didn't get through very many points today, did I? I got way too passionate, but I don't apologize for that. I laugh about it sometimes in the restaurant that I go to and minister to a number of the people. That have, I've kind of shaken my head because they get silly with it sometimes. But when I go in in the morning, and, and they're good people, I'm not, I'm not putting them down and saying this, not a single bit. They're just ornery. And I'll walk in the door and one of them will say, Oh man, we better behave now, the preacher's here. 
Let me say to you that I don't go in there saying, I am a preacher. I'm dressed in my t-shirt. I don't have clothes all the way down to my fingertips and, and all the way down to my toe tips and all of that kind of thing. I don't have any of that. I'm not carrying my Bible. I'm carrying my date book. So I'm not going in and saying, look at me, Mr. Holy Righteous. But they know. Why do they know? I don't act like everybody else that goes in there. Is that a self-righteous statement? If you're hearing self-righteousness, you just simply aren't listening. You see, you adjust the thermometer, you adjust the remolder, and it changes the atmosphere immediately. I can go into a very cold room and I can walk over to the thermometer. I do this at the church all of the time. I go over to the thermometer and I turn that thermometer up and shortly, there begins to be a warmth in that room. Is your church a remolder or is it a reflector? Is your life a remolder or a reflector? If you are living in the spirit and walking in the spirit and living in righteousness, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to look anything. You don't have to tell people how self-righteous you are. You don't need to tell people how great and wonderful you are. You don't need to tell people that you obey all of the laws. You walk into the room, the thermometer goes up and people around you recognize there's something different. That something different is because what you should be reflecting, what you should be a thermometer of, is the Christ-likeness that holiness and righteousness brings in your life. And I challenge you to ever, ever, ever in the three years of ministry that Jesus Christ walked this earth, I challenge you to ever, ever, ever show me where he showed self-righteousness and he had every right to show self-righteousness. He always, always exalted the Father, the Holy Spirit, living in me will always, always exalt the Son. That's what they do. So behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And when all things have become new, you don't have to show off yourself to anyone. You walk into the room and if you are living in the spirit, you are bringing the spirit into that room with you. And that is when his righteousness is exalted in you. And holiness and righteousness shines forth. Wow, I didn't mean to get so passionate today. But I hope that you are being challenged. I thought I was going to get all the way through point number eight. I only got through number six. And I really need to stop as I have gone on too long. The beauty of holiness elevates a nation. Do you want to see this nation changed back to God? Start praying for God to make his church Christ-like, not self-righteous. Thank you for listening. I hope you will listen next time. God bless you.